Peter came up and said to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. And then he told him the parable. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. These last few weeks we've been hearing a set of readings, and as I mentioned, I think, last week, it's helpful to hear uh, one reading to the next because you start to begin to see the whole context of uh, uh, themes that Jesus is working with. So two weeks ago we heard um, Jesus give, one of the multiple times in Matthew's Gospel, what we call the office of the keys. That special authority Christ has given to his church on earth to forgive the sins of repentant sinners, but to withhold forgiveness from the unrepentant as long as they do not repent. We talked about the proper exercise of those keys. Again, the binding and the loosing key, which correspond then to the words of God, namely the word of the law, which convicts us of our sins, binds them to us, and then the word of the gospel, which sets us free, forgives us our sins in Christ Jesus and his shed blood. So the office of the keys. Last week, then, we heard the following reading, which had to do with the children and how that authority of preaching God's word, rightfully distinguishing law and gospel, exercising the keys, um, is a, well, it's a fearful authority, especially when it comes to children because of the, the harm that we can bring to them when we bind things that are not their sins to them, putting them under the curse, or refusing to forgive them when they repent and thus never setting them free in Christ Jesus. So that authority must be properly exercised um, or it can do great harm, not only to little children, of course, but to to all of us. So it is not only a special authority given to the church to forgive and to retain sins, but one that must be exercised with great deal of caution, at least, or in particular, the binding key. That's associated usually with what we call excommunication or exclusion, at least the minor band from the altar for a time. Uh, Do that with great deliberation uh, and patiently in seeking the counsel of the whole church before that usually is exercised. And thus it happens pretty rarely, thank God. But to forgive sins is without such restraint. We uh, generally are given to just forgive all uh, regardless of what we think uh, they mean. If they confess whether we're not sure they really mean it, it doesn't really matter. They say, I'm sorry, you forgive them without exception and without limit. So the binding key has its limits because it belongs to the law, and the law is limited by God to that role of accusing us our sins. But the, the loosing key, the forgiving key, is boundless. It's without limit. It's a cup that overflows. It's given graciously and generously, um, and there's no limit, again, to what is under the gospel. Another way to think of this, then, is in terms of the parable today, which Jesus preached to Peter to actually bind him in his sin, because Peter refused to believe that forgiveness was boundless. So Jesus preaches a parable to him to actually confirm him in that sin. Peter rightly hears himself, I believe, um, as the one who refuses to forgive his brother, despite having been and will having been forgiven freely and fully all of his sins uh, through the future suffering and death of Jesus. So Peter is bound. And in that sermon, uh, we hear about debts and debtors, masters and servants. And all of that kind of language of accounting belongs to the law. The law, again, has limits. It also means that it has uh, has numbers. (laughs) We we add up our sins. We, We even number them. We number the commands that describe our sins. We describe our sins in terms of which commandment they fall under, one or more, or both, or all. And thus, uh, the law always has its limit. The problem is, though, is that even though there's numbers involved in debts, the master in the parable does something that's quite outrageous, and it's maybe lost in translation. So again, when he begins to settle the accounts with his servants, this is the last day, this is the kingdom of heaven, this is the judgment day, one was brought before him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, and maybe Jesus could have said since he could never, ever pay, since there was no way that anyone could ever pay such a debt, 
His master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. This demand of the master to pay 10,000 talents, how this man could have racked up such extraordinary debt, I don't remember in, in uh, modern day terms, this is tens of millions of dollars, just completely insane. There was no way that this man, even his, if he forfeited his very life, would ever repay this debt. And so, of course, the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And then, out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him all the debt. So, we do have numbers. We have this extraordinary debt of 10,000 talents, or just imagine millions and millions of dollars. There was no way he could pay it, and then this master does the most outrageous thing in the midst of this law parable. He has pity on him and forgives him. Now, the thing with forgiveness is that there is no way for to just simply write it off the books. What happened is the master took the debt on himself, which is the gospel note of the parable. Not only that the man was forgiven, but that the master then incurs all that debt. All that debt now goes on to his books. He can never remove it. And what a picture then of the free gift of forgiveness in Jesus Christ, the one who indeed took all of the world's sin upon himself. Um, became the debtor, became the sinner for you, and suffered the penalty of that debt, which would be death, and even by his death, and defeated the power of death because none of those sins were his, and death could not hold him. So even in the midst of this parable that Jesus teaches, uh, or gives to Peter, preaching to him and showing him how, well, he turns around and then doesn't forgive his neighbor, there is this wonderful gospel message, of course, that God the Father has forgiven us freely and fully in Jesus Christ, a debt that no one could ever pay, even if he could, or even thought he could attempt to sacrifice his whole life for Christ and his church, maybe even in church work. No, all that forgiveness is given to him as a gift of, of his master, without any merit or worthiness in him, as we say in the second article of the Creed. But again, Peter, he doesn't want to think of forgiveness as being full and free. And so he now has what he thinks to be set, you know, an, out, an outrageous amount, which is to forgive seven times. Now, most of us, um, we have a hard time forgiving one time. And if we do forgive that one time, we probably still hold some resentment or a grudge um, against that person which is still means that we haven't yet forgiven them. And so then we have to forgive them again. And we do this, we might do it repeatedly, maybe two or three times, but our patience has an end. It has a limit. We can't forgive that many times. Peter thinks he's being as outrageous as the master in the parable by saying, I'm going to forgive seven times. The rabbi is only required three times. And after that, you could be just be done with someone. But seven times, how incredible is that? That's a perfect number, right? The, the number of the week or seven, the number of the Sabbath, the perfect rest. How, how Christian would he be forgiving every day for a week and then holding the sin against them? Yeah, you see the problem here. And so Jesus again tells this parable to show him that forgiveness has no limit. It has no bounds. It does not belong to the law, and it is not then governed by any of the constraints of the law. It's not about restitution. It's not about debts owed anymore. It's not about making amends. No, forgiveness is simply to forgive the debt, to forget it. And then it has to be paid. All debt is paid. Place, it, place that sin upon Jesus, who already has died for it by his suffering and death on the cross. And only then can you actually forgive it if someone has actually suffered the penalty and paid the price so that it is literally off the books, off all of our ledgers. God doesn't even keep a ledger against us anymore. He doesn't even count our sins against us. They're forgotten. They're cast to the bottom of the sea or to the farthest coast, as we said in the psalm. So how often should you forgive your pastor when he sins against you? Three times? How about seven times? Jesus says 70 times seven. How often when you sin against me should I forgive you? Just seven times? That seems pretty generous. Peter is right. How about 70 times seven? 490, so that would be every day 
for a year and a half or so, and then I can stop, right? No. Just like the master who forgave um, his debtor, that outrageous debt, without even remembering it again because he paid the whole thing, put it on his, his tab. So Jesus has taken from us all of this bookkeeping, all the ledgers, all of the judging people and how forgiven they should be. Rather, just forgive freely, daily. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And that never ends, thankfully, into eternity. In Jesus' name, amen.